You're listening to Frank Talks Pleasures and Lifestyles, and I'm Frank because I have to be. In studio today, we have the man who runs the website, www.datingdynamics.com. His name is Carlos Zuma. Carlos, you there? I am here. All right. I want to talk about one-itis. You had used this term earlier. What is one-itis? How do you define it? And when somebody comes up to you and says, Carlos, I've got one-itis, what's the first thing you tell them? Well, one of this is the mistaken belief that the woman that you're infatuated with is somehow different from the other five or four or three, however many billion other women there are on the planet. The reality is that the woman that you're focused on, that you're so concentrating on, is not going to be more responsive to you by the obsession and fixation you have on her. Uh, the, there's a saying, you know, you are unique and special, just like everybody else. So this woman that you're really putting in this, unfortunately, uh, too high a pedestal is never going to be uh, attracted to that. So what you've got to learn how to do is pull back and put things back in perspective. First of all, your attitude and your confidence is shot when you focus on one woman entirely. When you train your sights on one woman, you've got no buffer to protect your attitude. Uh, when she rejects you or if she turns you down for a date, you're going to fall into a trap of wondering what it is you did wrong or what you should do next. You get very hyper-attentive. Um, you need to date other women. That's the big rule. That's my rule of thumb. I call it D-O-W, date other women. Because you maintain your attitude, you maintain your confidence, you maintain perspective and comparison. Because when you date more than one woman, you've got a frame of reference to compare and contrast their personalities. And uh, it's basically a truth check. You can also have better perceived value. After all, women want what other women want. A man is in demand uh, when other women want him. And you avoid what I call the obsessive self-destruct cycle or the downward spiral. This is where a guy finds a girl that he likes and he starts to focus all of his attentions on her. She starts to pull away because she feels like she's being run over and he continues to push harder because he feels like he's losing her and it goes down and he spirals down the drain. The only way to avoid that is to maintain healthy perspective, healthy balance, and again, shoring up your own sense of self-value so that you don't feel like you have to come on so strong. I got an email from someone who was writing to me for some frank advice related to this topic. I won't read the whole email, but I'll just summarize it. This guy has been in love with the same woman since he was a teenager. He's now in his mid-twenties. It's a ten-year infatuation. He still hasn't even approached her. He's not. He has not asked her out. He's written her a poem. He's thinking about giving it to her. What would you tell a guy like that? <laughs> Before I told him about uh, slapping himself around a little bit in the mirror and, and, and getting a wake-up call, um, really, the we all have these women in our lives, I think, the one that kind of sticks in our brain a little bit, maybe the one that got away or maybe the one that didn't quite get away or whatever it is, but we become fixated and... It's this obsession and fixation that's the true problem. Why is the guy so fixated on her? And why does he think that his actions are going to net him the result that he thinks he's going to get? Again, the same, same advice still holds true. What he has to do is get out there and expose himself to an abundance mindset. The reason the guys get fixated on these, these icons in their mind is because they have a scarcity mindset. They don't see possibility. They only see a limited amount of everything, a limited quantity, a limited amount of success. There's only so much money to go around. Everything is a scarcity mindset, and that's why they chase after these women. If you go out and date 10 women or 20 women and you know get into genuine, not half-assed or you know mo- just uh, marginal conversations with them, if you actually engage them, you're going to find that that woman doesn't seem quite as interesting after all. She may be in the back of your head, but she doesn't have to be your fixation and obsession. Do you think that most seduction instructors out there all have had this type of experience at one point or another uh, growing up and as part of their development? I think so. I think it's, it's something we've all gone through. Hell, I'll admit to it that I've actually, in the last you know year, I actually got in contact with an old childhood sweetheart of mine, not to try and start things up again, but just to see how she was doing and kind of reconnect. We all have these people that, and I think they're, they're a, um, a turning point in our lives in a lot of ways because they push us to an extreme, and I call it bottoming out. Unfortunately, most of us will not change until we hit a certain level of disgust or bottom out with our attitude, and that gives us something to push off of. It's like sinking to the bottom of a lake. Once you can push off the bottom, you can come back to the surface again and fix things. You know, in my own story, um, in my autobiography, I talk about losing my ex-fiancé after a series of really bad events, 
getting stood up at the prom being one of them, and reaching a level of rock bottom where it's either fix this or just forget about it. And why do you think people need to hit this kind of rock bottom, as you call it, bottoming out, before they're actually going to make a change? It's a psychological thing. I think we don't really feel the intensity of pain that's necessary to change. We're all driven by pain and pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. you now we're driven away from pain and we're driven towards pleasure. Unfortunate thing about pleasure is that it's a very vague and not not as motivating as the push away from pain. Pain we can imagine vividly. We know what that feels like and we hate it and it's a very strong, strong motivator. Uh, so when we feel that pain of hitting rock bottom, that's enough to turn us around. It's not the lure of what we could get. Most often it's the push away from the pain that we are experiencing. How does someone maintain faith that taking care of this part of their lives, the study of seduction, is actually going to work out for them when everything in their past tells them that they simply were not successful with this? You know, I guess I'd, I'd have to liken it to the warning you get that with the prospectus on any mutual fund, you know, that says, warning, past performance does not indicate future performance. Nothing guarantees you the future, and that's a good thing because <laughs> all those mistakes, all those problems you've had in the, in the past can be immediately eradicated by a whole new approach in the future. What got you all those bad results was bad thinking, which led to, led to bad beliefs, which led to bad actions, which gave you bad results. If you change that chain of events from here forward, you're going to net different results. And you think, and you think that that's enough to keep someone? Because I mean, the study of seduction is not an easy one. This is a life-altering path for some people. Yep. They really have to change who they are. It's not just learning a new pickup line. It's not learning the next technique that's uh, going to change their life or get them to grow their dreams. This is a, a, a radical fundamental change at our deepest levels that may start with techniques but eventually it leads on to deeper issues it's such a difficult path for some for some people it may take years to accomplish some people get it in a matter of weeks or even months in your experience as a seduction instructor what has been some of the key elements that has kept guys on the right path even when the long-term uh, road wasn't easy um, there's been a lot of things that I, funny enough one of them and it, it isn't necessarily religion or spiritually based is just faith you know faith in themselves faith in what they're going after and what they're trying to accomplish with their lives and I mean you have to have a certain level of faith and you get that uh, to a certain degree from watching other examples and, and reading the materials and having these realizations and epiphanies and getting these distinctions um, besides that is just a dogged what I call a bulldog uh, attitude, and you know when a bulldog gets one of those those rag dolls in his mouth, and he starts tearing down on it, he's like, Arr! you know, he won't let go of it. That's what you got to do with your own self development, really. I mean, you got what like uh, for most of the guys that are in this area, let's say they're you know maybe around twenty to twenty five years old, maybe older, um, but you got another good forty to fifty maybe years of your life left. What else are you going to do with your time except work on yourself? What else is worth working on? For me, I just can't think of anything else. So I'm going to be working on myself till the day I, dry, I die. You know, it's it's just the way it is. So you've got to be putting yourself on that path, be dogged, relentless, perseverance, and just stick to it and have faith. And then, of course, create your own support system. Have something there in case you reach those dull, those low points. Because every guy does. He hits a low point, doesn't know what to do. He should have his, uh, you know, like they used to have on that Who Wants to Be a Millionaire show, that friend you could call. There's got to be somebody there that you can tap into that can give you a boost and much-needed motivation. 